Hello to all of you. I wish I was with you to present these reflections in person, but I hope this will be an acceptable substitute. I'm grateful to Clint for making this possible. I'm going to read four excerpts <clears throat> from my 340-page autobiography titled Seeking Significance Outside and In, A Life in Music and Words. And the excerpts progress from the longest to the shortest. So here's number one. We're 12 years old, and the conversation on the Brooklyn street corner turns to what instrument we're going to play. I'm not sure how or why that issue is raised, only that it is simply assumed by some of us that playing an instrument is something that you just naturally do. So I think it over. My nickname is Benny, and perhaps because Benny Goodman is a cultural icon in those days, I figure that the clarinet would kind of make sense. So that's what I say. I'm going to take clarinet, <clears throat> is my statement. Now, tape means taking lessons. We know, that's, we know that that's what you have to do if you're going to play. I talk it over with my parents, and they agree that it will be a nice thing for me to get involved with. But how does one go about doing it? Well, we could call the local music store, a trolley ride away on King's Highway, and ask them what we should do. Mom calls, and they say that they can rent me a metal clarinet, <clears throat> give me weekly lessons in their basement, <clears throat> and after 10 lessons, excuse me, we would make an appraisal as to whether I want to continue and whether they feel I'm suited to continue. Sounds reasonable. So I get enrolled. 10 weeks later, Mom and I go in for the conference. Their assessment by the teacher and the salesman is enthusiastic. Terrific progress, Mrs. Reamer. He's a natural. Lots of talent. We definitely recommend that he continue. With a good instrument, a good mouthpiece, <clears throat> a good choice of reeds, and a good teacher, he can go far. And <clears throat> we can supply you with all of those things, and we can give you a good price because we got a big sale going on this week. That I am talented, supremely, says Mom, a natural, a natural? He's a genius. My mom would have told them before I even started. Upon getting the expected confirmation, she says, we'll think about it, grabs my hand, and whisks me out of there. I'm stunned. Doesn't she want me to continue, as I hope she will? Listen, Bennett, they're in their business. You think they don't want to make a little money on this? She explains on the trolley ride home. Just you wait to see what your mother intends to do. Upon arriving home, she goes straight to the phone and makes a call that will largely determine the outward and in many ways the inward journeys that are to constitute the major thrust of my life. Hello, operator? Give me the number of the Juilliard School of Music. My son, the musician, needs lessons on the clarinet. What can I tell you? Soon thereafter, I wander the halls of Juilliard before a scheduled lesson clutching in one hand my new clarinet, now appropriately wooden, in the other my lesson books. I am in awe of the college-age students all around, many of them also carrying one or another instrument. They hardly notice me, being used to seeing kids around, but I notice everything about them, how they are dressed, how they interact, what they are chatting about. These are grown-ups I want to be like. Music freaks all a world they inhabit that seems to be a natural place for me to live also. Not glamorous particularly, they mostly look kind of ordinary, even scruffy, but with an intensity, a sense of mission, a devotion to something almost magical, this special world in which meaningful sounds give life itself a supreme meaning. Now, sometimes my lessons are in a studio that Mr. Naser, the teacher recommended to me, rents in the building that houses Carnegie Hall. After one of these lessons, I'm in a hurry to catch the subway home, so I take a stairway I calculate will get me to the lobby exit quickly. But I am soon bewildered by doors leading elsewhere as I try one after another on descending floors with no success. A larger door appears on a flight further down, and I go through it. I find myself in the backstage area of the hall itself. 
No one is there. Only a few dim lights, illuminating chairs, music stands, a piano, cabinets. I am drawn to enter and cautiously, slowly walk toward the stage and out to the middle of it. In front of me is the panorama of this most famous musical space in the United States, perhaps in the world, a hall so storied as to define this art at its highest reaches of accomplishment and prestige. I stand transfixed, my heart pumping noticeably, prickles rising on the back of my neck. This is a sacred place, a place I know enough about to be aware of its hallowed status a place I am now related to by my being an initiate in the world of music, despite at the very first steps. Here in this holy of holies, I am suffused with the sense that I am a particle in something infinitely large and important. So majestic as to touch me, insignificant as I am, with its grandeur. My inner being has shifted. Among the spiritual experiences I am to seek throughout my life, this one will remain the paradigm. My lessons possess no such quality, much as I devote myself to them. Each week I am assigned the next three or four pages in one of the standard clarinet exercise books, Closet, Bettany Behrman, Longinus, Rose. I practice them fiercely. I pick up on reading musical notation as if I am born to it and my physical capacities to rise to the steadily increasing technical challenges I am encountering week to week, month to month, seem to be limitless. Mr. Naser piles it on, setting tempos increasingly fast no matter the complexities of the etudes, pushing, pushing, swatting me on the back of the head with every missed note. <laughs> A gesture of affection I accept with equal feeling, although it motivates me mightily to avoid errors. Two years go by, and I am into the dreaded Jean Jean studies, so perversely difficult as to make grown clarinetists cry. Do it again, he says, a little faster and pay more attention to the dynamics, you hear me? Okay, okay. One day, after my usual routine of faster, faster, kill, kill, Mr. Nazer asks me a startling question. Do you have a friend who plays piano? Why in the world would he ask me that, I wonder? Yeah, I reply, sure. In fact, I have several such friends. He reaches over to a stack of music on the floor and fishes out several pages. Here's a piece you can enjoy playing with your friend. Take it home and give it a try. On the way home, I look it over. Miami Moon by De Buris, a name I am never again to see. There's a part for clarinet and a part for piano. The clarinet part is not difficult at all. I could have played it several months after starting lessons. The piano part is Greek to me. I know what the separate notes and rhythms mean, of course, but I've never seen all those notes together as in piano music. Do the two parts, clarinet and piano, get together somehow? Confusing. I meet with a friend in his living room, and he looks over his part. OK, he says, I play an introduction, and then you start. Uh, when do I start? Well, look at your part. At the beginning, you have four measures of rest. Then you start. Um, okay. In my exercise books, there are never four measures of rest. I mean, what would be the point? He starts, and I get the idea to count the beats of four measures. Then I start playing my part, and to my amazement, he continues playing, and we are both playing together, and each part fits with the other in a whole that is infinitely larger than the sum of its parts. I'm astonished. I'm playing music, not exercises. The sounds we're making, that I am making, are so beautiful, so fully integrated, so completely different from anything I've ever done in my lessons, that I am transported, astonished that I am capable of making sounds that are more than technical, that are genuinely musical, that reach deeply into my soul. The piece itself, I realize later, is inconsequential, musically speaking, but that matters not at all to me then. I have been introduced, unjustifiably late in my development, to being a musician rather than only a technician, and a new world of fulfillment opens itself to me. 
my teacher, an important and well-regarded clarinetist and saxophonist in the New York musical world, is steeped in the old conservatory system of how beginners ought to be properly trained. So he has, with all good intentions, first attended to technique, and when he feels I am ready, I can then begin to make music. Apparently, I have reached that point, and his lessons switch from the rigorously technical to the musical. His focus now on coaching me to play the classical literature for clarinet as professionals properly do. I have in my command by then practically all the chops that I require, but my sensitivity to and understanding of expressive artistry must catch up, having been left entirely neglected. I have progressed well as a player of the clarinet. Now I am to learn to be a musician. It is as a musician I come to realize that the integrity of music is experienced by those who choose that musical role to play. Technique is a means, not the end, necessary as it is. My musicianship has been ignored for far too long a time, unnecessarily, leaving me lopsided in my development. Avoiding this mistake becomes a lesson I emphasize as a foundational construct when, later, I share my philosophy of music education with a worldwide audience. Second excerpt. September 1960. The fall semester at the University of Illinois starts, and I am thrown into the busy life of a faculty member. Getting the course I am teaching started, working in the teacher placement office, taking two courses toward the doctorate. The faculty orchestra, just formed, meets in rehearsal for the first time. I am greeted by many members whom I know from my previous sojourns there, and I am particularly delighted, having added the oboe to my clarinet and saxophone backgrounds, to be sitting second chair to the oboe teacher, David Lede, now not as his student, but as a colleague. The rehearsal begins, and I am immersed, as so often before, in the majestic world of the symphony orchestra, a world unlike any other. My small contribution, as that of all the others, one sound in a rich, infinitely subtle, yet powerful whole, the diverse combination of sounds magically unified, a whole so endlessly colorful, so protean, so rife with potential for musical meaning as to be unparalleled, unparalleled in this art's history. I lose myself in the unfolding sounds, yet as required by each player, am intensely in control of what the music requires of me. Oneness of a very concentrated, very exacting sort, yet completeness as the self merges into the totality of what is coming to sonic life, including but going beyond one's particularity of contribution. No wonder that all who have experienced this particular self with world, this self in meaning making with others, this intensely individual yet exquisitely communal creative process have been changed forever by its spiritual power. For me, it creates a completeness, a healing, worth all the work it takes to be able to achieve it. It is as profound a fulfillment as I am able to experience. No wonder I immerse myself in it as an essential life involvement and devote myself to sharing it through education, both for the few who will perform or compose music and the many who will share the fulfillments music provides by partaking of what musicians do. In the midst of my absorption, a flash of pain streaks to the left side of my chest, chest. What the hell? It goes away, so I try not to pay attention to it. A few minutes later, it happens again, this time shooting up my neck and down my left arm. Impossible now to ignore. I'm able to finish the rehearsal, the intermittent pain destroying my concentration, but allowing me to play through it sufficiently to avoid anyone noticing. I go home and call the local hospital and describe my symptoms. They tell me to get there immediately. A quick check when I arrive determines that it is not, it is not the suspected heart attack. Further testing reveals the situation. A spontaneous pneumothorax, they tell me. 
your left lung has collapsed. We'll get you to bed, and the thoracic surgeon will see you first thing in the morning. Dr. Cooley introduces himself and listens through his stethoscope as I breathe deeply. Well, he says, you sure do have a collapsed lung. What were you doing when it happened? I explain the circumstance, and he nods knowingly. No surprise, Mr. Reamer. When players' lungs go pop, pop, pop every now and then, goes with the territory. He tells me that he can get the lung back up, but he has doubts as to whether I can, con I can continue to play. I'm in a state of shock. I'm going to insert a hollow needle into the area where the air is collecting, and the suction machine it's attached to will gradually catch up with the leak, allowing the lung to expand back against the chest wall. Then we'll have to see if it heals itself, and if it might be safe for you to play again. I'm struck dumb. If it might be safe to play again? What is he implying? My skin crawls. Several weeks later, having not touched my instrument, the same shooting pain in my chest happens again while having lunch before a class I am scheduled to teach. This time I know what's up. Off I go to the hospital. The same routine again seems to be successful, but now Cooley takes a harder stance. Do you really have to play, he says? This may not happen again, but the chances are far greater that it will if you go back to blowing that oboe thing or any other instrument. You can't just go on having this happen. I put my clarinet, oboe, and tenor sax away, hoping I can use them sometime in the future when, perhaps, it might be safe to play again, although I'm not clear what would allow that to happen. Ten years later, when I am teaching at Western Reserve University in Cleveland, I have a semester off for sabbatical, and having had no recurrence for all that time, figure it would be great to be back in shape enough to play some chamber music occasionally, just to enjoy myself in a casual way. But I figure I had better check with my physician, just to be sure. I tell him my plan and remind him that I've had no problem for 10 years. Well, he says, you haven't played for 10 years. Don't you think that accounts for why you've had no problem? Damn, hadn't thought of that. I say a last farewell to my life as a performer and sell my instruments. That life never leaves my consciousness. I often feel, as the years go by, like those who have lost a limb and experience phantom limb syndrome, the sense that while it is obvious that the limb is gone, it nevertheless, nevertheless still feels present, only unseen. I often experience phantom performer syndrome my body and mind and feelings, processing music as performers do, dwelling in music from the inside as if I'm creating the sounds I can no longer produce. I live in my being with the ongoing loss of what has so formed my outer and inner life during my early years, a loss at first so deep as to be felt inside my body even when it is not present to my consciousness, a part of me so ingrained has to be instinctual. As time passes, the intensity of the loss gradually fades, as it must, thankfully. But it never disappears, never entirely releases me from its formative grasp, thankfully. Number three. As chair of the music education department at Western Reserve University, I am working in my office when I get a phone call from my mentor at the University of Illinois, Charlie Leonard. Any of you know Charlie Leonard? If you do, you've had the same experience I've had. We have been in touch to keep up with each other's activities. This call is for business. He has agreed with Apprentice, Apprentice Hall Publishing Company to be general editor of a series of books on various areas of knowledge and processes in music education. This will be a departure from the traditional focus of music education books on levels, elementary school, junior high, high school, and specializations, general music, band, orchestra, chorus. He is hoping to commission, to commission books on philosophy, psychology, research, evaluation, method, administration, program development, and perhaps other such fields in music education. 
He scoured for the country, the country, for the recommendations as to who is most highly qualified to write the philosophy of music education book. And it is clear that, as he suspects will happen, the consensus is that I am that person. My name keeps cropping up, Leonard tells me, because of my dissertation, which is clearly philosophical and the first of its sort, of its sort in the history of music education, and because many of my published articles are also distinctly philosophical in nature. No one else at that time has established the philosophical expertise I have demonstrated, Leonard says. You're my choice, Bennett, no question about it. I'm delighted to have my opinion verified by others. I'm confident you can do a fine job and will be a historical contribution to the profession. What do you say? In 1970, after two and a half years of being possessed with the writing of it, my A Philosophy of Music Education appears. I hold one of the copies the publisher sends me, wondering how I knew enough to fill these pages with thoughts I find compelling as I skim them. Oddly, they seem separate from me, so distant from the, heats, the heat in which the thoughts were expressed when pen moved on paper, as to not seem to be mine in any intimate sense. I wrote all this, I say to myself. How did I do that? I'm regularly amused by people saying to me, oh, you must love to write. Unaware of the daily struggle, the mental counterpart of birthing entailed in the act of writing, especially when under contract and the days passing swiftly. Yes, I guess love, I do love it in a peculiar way. Yet I also despair that I am driven to do it, to submit myself to its extortionate claims on my inner and outer being. I have wanted the life of a writer since first tasting its sweetness. Now I have it, <clears throat> and as with good wine, I taste also the acidity that must underlie it if it is to be balanced. The puzzling thing to be a writer, to hold in my hand this strange child born of my brain, so close to me and so distant that inevitably will have its own career its own adventures in the world, out of my control, as with one's actual children. Books written, children fathered, are blessings decidedly mixed. And finally, musician, teacher, scholar, author, lecturer, administrator, project director, all these and other roles have been enabled by my life as a music educator. From the Brooklyn street corner where I grew up to the present, my life has been enriched by the challenges and fulfillments the field of music education has provided me so plentifully. A fortunate life in every way. The cherry on top of the ice cream sundae is the pleasure of observing so many of my students being as deeply engrossed in music education leadership as I have been fortunate to have been. What goes around comes around, for me, in wondrously satisfying ways. Thank you for listening. <laughs>